What's up everybody, welcome to another episode of Be Is For Build. I'm Chris, if you don't know me, I'm the guy that, that quite famously lost his Eleanor build a couple years back when Denise Halicki and her goon squad came after me and threatened legal action for using the name and likeness of their movie character, Eleanor. And you might have heard in the news recently, Carol Shelby and his team won a massive court case against Denise Halicki and her team about the copyright protectability of Eleanor. And after the news that Shelby One came out, everybody's come to me and said, man, get your build back. Chris, go get your build back. Are you gonna build another Eleanor? What's what's going on? And that's what today's video is about. I wanna talk about a little bit of the history of what happened between me and them, what I can say now. I also wanna talk about what the court case had in it that was just somewhat interesting and define what it means. And then also my plans with Eleanor moving forward. What am I gonna do about it? Now, I do wanna say that just because Shelby won their case, that doesn't have a lot of impact on what happened between me and them and where that still stands. An interesting thing though is it does mean that the reason that they came after me in the first place is now null and void, but my situation is still not over. And I apologize, this video did take a little bit of time to get out because I wanted my lawyer to be able to approve it and keep me safe from any further legal action. And after this latest round of talks with my lawyers, that brings my legal fees from the past and the present to near $10,000. So please enjoy this word from our sponsor. Before we get down to work, I want to take a second out to thank our sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Native. Native started with deodorants, but now they have everything from hair care products, body lotions, and body washes as well. And one of the reasons I really wanted to partner with Native is because Chelsea has been using them for years and told me how good it is. So they sent me out a bunch of different products. You got a deodorant here, this is coconut vanilla. And the scent reminds me of surfing. I've been trying this out for days and the texture on it is really nice. It's not sticky and it goes on nice and dry when you're applying it. And the scents just keep on coming. I've got the citrus herbal musk. Now this one smells more, uh, more musky, more manly but the citrus gives it a real nice touch. I've got the sea salt and cedar, which again is a pretty manly smell. It smells very good though, and not overpowering, more on the refreshing side. And my favorite one is the cucumber mint. This one smells what I imagine a tropical island would smell like. And they're aluminum free and paraben free, and they're vegan and cruelty free as well. So I've been using it for weeks and I really like it, but Chelsea's been using it for like I said, years. So I stole some stuff out of our upstairs bathroom. This is what she's got and she wanted me to show you guys. Around the Christmas season, she, they have candy cane scent, which is a very cool scent. And then she has her own coconut vanilla that's travel size, which she loves it because it's travel size, she can bring it with her. So if you're ready to up your deodorant game, check out the link in the top of the description. You can get three deodorants, which would normally cost you $39. But if you use my link and my code, which is BBUILD, like think BBUILD, you'll get them for $26. And that's over 33% off with my code. And you can also get 20% off body wash or lotion, which I also got. So like I said, link is at the top of the description, guys. Go check it out. It's some good stuff. Let's get back to work. All right, jumping back into it. So like I said, my lawyer has given me a pretty strict set of rules of things that I should not say, uh, different stories that I should not tell, and things I shouldn't mention to keep myself safe legally. So if I say something kind of weird or I maybe intentionally leave something out, that's why. So I want to jump in and start by telling you guys my story and how, in my opinion, these guys are freaking crazy, man. So this all started for me around 2002, a couple months after COVID hit. We're working on this body swap project. We got a car that's looking closer to like, I would say a Shelby GT500, but I had used the word Eleanor in the title a few different places and I got hit with a cease and desist. Now, cease and desists, they come and they go and they're not all as serious. Uh, this cease and desist I found was very interesting for two reasons. One was the amount of information that they had about myself, my company, and and my team in the cease and desist. It was very clear to me, or how do I say this? I think that they spent what I think is a lot of money on private investigators to follow us around for probably quite a while to get dig into this and find all the information they could about us, which was very interesting. They had some information in there that I barely even knew. Like what's Oscar's middle name? I don't know, but it does make sense. Like theoretically, if you're going to sue somebody, you'd probably wanna make sure they had some money to sue them for before you call the lawyer. The second thing about the cease and desist that was very interesting to me was how unprofessional it was, in my opinion. It was riddled with typos. In my opinion, it had a bunch of garbage run on sentences that were just disjoined and didn't make sense. But this level of unprofessionalism did become a pattern. So I did want to say though that when I was building this car, I had no idea that what I was doing was, was considered wrong or that somebody that owned this intellectual property would be pissed that I was doing this. To be quite frank with you, I've got friends that build cars from movies Fast and the Furious and, and other movies and stuff like that, and nobody's ever batted an eye. So I did not think that what I was doing was negatively impacting somebody else in their business. It turns out it was. And I'm a nice guy. That's like not how I roll. I would never want to do something on purpose to, to, 
like that. So we did jump on the phone and I immediately wanted to try and make things right because I did feel like I had done something wrong. And that's when the just total shit storm fell down. The phone call was just one of the nastiest calls I've ever been on. And I offered to do a lot of things, guys. I offered to remove any name and likeness of Eleanor from all the episodes and edit all the clips down and, and take, I offered to take all the videos down. I offered to change the build to something completely different than anything related to Eleanor. Uh, I offered everything I could imagine that allowed me to keep this build going and bring it to fruition. I offered to buy an Eleanor license for the same price that the other licensees buy them for. And the response that I got from that that was not good. It was a lot of nasty threats, and I believe that they were basically threatening me with what's called a, a slap suit. So if you don't know what a slap suit is, I'll try and break it down real quick, and it's just a complete theoretical. Let's say completely theoretically, uh, you sue somebody for damages of like however much money you think you can get. Uh, let's say it's like like the court appoints you damages of, of $10,000. So I owe you $10,000. A lot of times nowadays, the court will also grant you the right to also sue for the cost of your legal fees, your attorney's costs and stuff like that. So say you went out and got the most expensive attorneys you could find and maybe hired super expensive private investigators and all that crap to come after somebody. And even though the judge just appointed, yeah, damages of $10,000, if you have $300,000 in legal fees, then this person that did $10,000 worth of damages ends up putting a bill of like $310,000. And using the threat of the cost of those legal fees and stuff like that, that's, uh, as far as my understanding, consider what a slap suit is. So you're really using the threat of the broken legal system that we have against the person, not the threat of them paying up for what they did that's actually wrong. Anyways, that's about where my lawyer tells me it's time to end story time. But I, I say that all just to explain that like I, I felt like they were um, not nice, definitely not really excited to let me, in my opinion, just do what it was to make things right. I felt like they were overreaching. And I really felt like they were using a broken court system that we have here in America against me like as a weapon. And that pissed me off. That's why I'm making this video today. But I wasn't the only one that was mad. And I mean, as a result, when just the stuff that you guys know went public, it went completely viral, traveled around the automotive scene all over the place, and it left a bad taste in people's mouths. In my opinion, it really, really hurt their reputation. It hurt the reputation of the Eleanor car. Uh, I know it pissed off some of the people that build the license one. So some of the way that they made money, I did not know this when I started, was they sell the license to shops that were building licensed Eleanors for clients. They called me, one of them called me and was very unhappy. <laughs> I said, man, you're talking to the wrong person. I didn't start this. And in my opinion, I think it really, really messed with the value of the Eleanor cars in general. Uh, if you want to take a picture of your precious Eleanor and put it up on social media anywhere, um, go ahead. I love reading the comment section. And after all that stuff was said and done, I thought we were moving on. I got a bunch of angry phone calls, angry emails, and another cease and desist over this Mustang. This is a 2007 Mustang GT that I built a while back. It has nothing to do with the Eleanor name, the likeness across any of the movies, absolutely nothing. But this is how far they thought their reach went and their legal power went. They threatened legal action over this one. So I convened with my legal team, we discussed this, we decided that we will win in court and we definitely would be happy to go to court to fight over this one. So we said no, they asked for money, they wanted money for me to make this to go away. Uh, and then I told him to kick rocks and neither me or my lawyer have heard from him ever since. So after the bill was gone and after the car was gone, we felt like we took an L there, but I'm not the type that likes to uh, give up on a project. We wanted to prove out the process. We wanted to prove that we could do it. So we brought in another 2015, 2016 or 17, I think, Mustang GT and a 67 body. And we built a Mustang for Oscar. He always wanted the coupe style rather than the fastback. So I said, this is perfect, man. Let's build this for you to prove that we can do it. We built this awesome patina Mustang that's been seen by millions of people and we pulled off the project. And years later, we built our 67 Mustang Fastback that we debuted at SEMA 2022, which a lot of you guys have seen recently, that was cool enough that I honestly think that we finally built something that looks cooler than an Eleanor. So it finally kind of come full circle. I was happy, I had my Mustang, and then a couple weeks later, the courts in California released this summary of judgment about this crazy lawsuit that had been going on between Shelby and his team and Denise Licky and their team for a while now. Now, a few people have asked, did, did Shelby go after these guys as a result of what happened with you? And I can pretty confidently say no. Now, that would be super cool. I have no idea of knowing how long this court case has gone on for, but I could see by looking at the document that it, there are some pretty serious reasons that they had to jump back into this court case. And I don't think that they did it very lightly. So this document is 41 pages long. I'm gonna try and keep it as brief as I can. I'm just gonna only cherry pick out the things that I found really interesting and the reason that it all happened. But it's also linked down below. If you wanna read it, it's a little bit of legalese. It's a little bit hard to read through. But just the stuff that you'll 
I'm sure understand is there's a lot of interesting stuff in there and you can kind of get a, a picture painted for some of the stuff that I went through as well. So early on in the document, you can see that it's not just between Shelby and their team and Denise Halicki and their team. Um, there's also an, another team involved. Tony and Jason Engel represented in the document as CR parties. CR stands for classic recreations. When I was doing my research for my case, I had seen that these guys had been to court with Denise Halicki and their team uh, a few times, and I believe they lost every time. And this is just my memory, so I could be totally off, but I think it was around Eleanor building stuff and complications of that where the, the business deal didn't do well. And then from the looks of it, this is just total uh, guessing, I, it looked like Classic Recreation started building cars that were much more similar to a Shelby GT500, uh, completely pushing the Eleanor stuff aside uh, so they could continue their business, and they built some amazing, beautiful cars. Take a look at this car right here. It's epic. And that's a Shelby GT500 with some modern touches. So anyways, I'd heard of these guys before. They make really cool stuff. And um, it was interesting to see them in this document. And I wanted to see why. And in this document later on, it actually reads that Shelby has some sort of a partnership with Classic Recreations. And I think that was a big part of the reason why they're in this document as well. So to tell the whole story, we got to jump back a little bit. Shelby and their subsidiaries, Shelby Parties and Halicki Parties, they went to court battle uh, before. It was like a decade ago. And my theory is that basically... Uh, after the movie and the success of the movie, Halicki and her team started li licensing out to shops to build Eleanor's and trying to build recreations of the movie car and get money off of that. And Shelby was really pissed because Eleanor was really built off of a GT500, which is his creation. So he started building them as well. And then they went into this battle of who owns the rights of it and is it copyrightable? That's my theory. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not a lawyer. So they went to court for a long time. It went through a bunch of different series of courts to higher courts and lower courts, kicking it around. And in the end, it says that they came to a settlement. And that makes it really hard to figure out what the hell happened because settlements usually are private and it's really hard to find any information about those. So why did they go back to court? It reads in the document, under license from Shelby parties to CR parties make a series of cars with designation GT500 CR that Halicki parties claim infringes on their rights and the Eleanor character. The Halicki parties demanded that the CR parties cease and desist. I think that's point one. Now switching over, and they, meaning the Halicki parties, also began contacting GT500 E owners and an auction house to assert their purported intellectual property interest in those vehicles and effectively prevent their resale. The Shelby parties initiated this suit thereafter, claiming inter alia, no idea what an inter alia is, I think that's like in here somewhere, that the Halicki parties conducted breaches of the settlement agreement. That's the agreement that I talked about earlier. The Halicki parties maintain counterclaims against Shelby parties and CR parties for inter alia, copyright infringement and breach of settlement. So my interpretation of that, in my opinion, again, this is just my understanding of it, could be wrong, not a lawyer. Can I say anything else to protect myself here? It looks like Denise and her team started going around and calling GT500 E owners. Now those are the super snake cars that Shelby had made before. And I think they were protected under their settlement last time. And they were going after the owners saying, hey, you're, you're, you own a car that's in, infringing on our, our intellectual property. And they're going to the auction houses telling them that they own cars. So it's looking bad on Shelby, like Shelby's produced cars that are illegal. And also it looks like they're going after classic recreations, issuing cease and desist orders for, I can only assume this car that they offered, this is just my guess, which this is the closest looking to an Eleanor, but it is not an Eleanor. And it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, they have a history of overreaching and claiming crazy stuff that's not an Eleanor, like a 75% done Mustang that has no paint or anything on it as an Eleanor, or a 2007 Mustang GT. So am I surprised? No. But I think what they were doing was messing with Shelby's reputation, pissing off Shelby enough, and messing with their partners that they said, it's time to go back to court. Again, that's just my assumption. And at the end of this, I will talk about exactly how kind of the Eleanor came to be and who owns what, what is an Eleanor, in my opinion, on that whole thing. And again, I'll tell you about what I'm doing moving forward. So as you scroll down in the document a little bit more, it gets to the root of the thing. Both parties have a disagreement on whether or not Eleanor is a character subject to copyright protection. So again, I'm picking out the interesting stuff. And this one, this part is really interesting to me. There were court cases that happened before and there are proceedings that happened before and they were mentioned in this case. So they looked into it. And here's some of the stuff that they wrote. Much of the Ninth Circuit panel's commentary on the copyrightability issue appears to have stemmed from an unfortunate practice on the part of Halicki parties to embellish facts in their briefing. Due to space limitations or inadvertence, several of these exaggerations were left unchallenged and made their way into court orders. That's a no-no. Embellishing on the facts sounds a lot like lying, Miss Halicki. It continues, in connection with the copyrightability motions, the court dispenses with the party's argumentative characterizations of the facts. 
and the other judicial officers' recitations of them. Instead, the court has independently scrutinized the four featured films in which Eleanor appears. Let me repeat that. Instead, the court has independently scrutinized the four featured films in which Eleanor appears. Now, the tone of this and the writing of this, where they talk about how we are going to dispense with the party's argumentative characterizations of the facts and other judicial officers' recitations of them, it really, to me, in my opinion, I think sounds like the other courts didn't even watch the four movies. I mean, it's just four movies, guys. And you know what? One of them is actually good. I really, really, really hope that they're not that bad at their job that they didn't take the time to watch four movies. But I don't know. But all it's actually factually stating here, I believe, is that they're saying, hey, we did take the time to watch the four movies. And after we watched the four movies, drum roll, please. The court concludes in a matter of law that Eleanor is not subject to copyright protection. Okay, the court has this practice of applying this thing called a Daniels test. I guess it's something that's been used in the past to prove copyrightability. The Eleanor did not pass the Daniels test, guys. And again, I'm cherry picking here, but one of the things that really jumps out at me is, is how they pointed out that it doesn't have an identifiable likeness a, a, across the four movies. In one movie, it's one year. I think it's a 1971, could be wrong. I think it's yellow, could be wrong. And then in other movies, like the more modern movies, it's a 67, and part of the movie it's rusty, and part of the movie it's gray. It's not consistent throughout the movies. And why I find that interesting is something I wanna bring up is because if you grant copyright protection to something that is that vast and it's that different, and let's take that whole Eleanor thing and push it aside, but just talk in theoretics here. If you're saying, hey, I'm giving copyright to a character, like let's take Lightning McQueen. If Lightning McQueen was like six different car brands and it was just like the only thing that they had in common was that they were all just red, then Disney could just start coming after and suing anybody with a red car. And that's really, really dangerous for the court system to pass something that crazy. And in my opinion, that is kind of what happened here with this Eleanor team and why they started getting so crazy about coming after people like me for 2007 black Mustang GTs. Like, what are we even talking about anymore? They say in this document that it needs identifiable traits to qualify for copyright protection. And it says right here, it says, at most, Eleanor's character's consistent and identifiable traits and attributes that make it recognizable are that it's a Ford Mustang called by the name Eleanor. These characteristics hard amount to a core set of traits that make the character immediately recognizable. True! So to me, a lot of this, very frustrating that the first round of chords didn't get this right. It was pretty obvious and it would have saved me from everything. So yeah, they finished their court case and it says Eleanor no longer has standalone copyright protection. And I'm not a lawyer, but I think that that means if you want to build one, you can go right ahead. Now a question a lot of you guys have asked me is, am I going to build one? And let me, let me explain something here. It's a little strange, but I gotta explain this. The Eleanor design is more of a Carol Shelby design than an Eleanor design. And that sounds really weird, so let me, let me unpack this a little bit. This game's a lot more fun with pictures. So what I wanna do is I wanna show you guys what it takes to go from a stock 67 Mustang Fastback to a Carroll Shelby GT500. Starting in the front, you have a modified lower front bumper with a bigger air scoop for airflow. You have another set of lights placed center in the upper grill area. You have the hood pins. You have the raised hood bulge in the middle. Moving down the sides of the door, you're gonna see that vent right at the back of the door in the rear quarter panel. The upper rear quarter panel, another custom vent. And then as we move to the back, it's just a piece of art with you have the duck bill, trunk lid, you have the duckbill end caps to match the trunk lid. You have the horizontal custom taillights, I think are out of a Mercury. And last but not least, you got some racing stripes. He changed almost every single part of this car in one way or another. He came up with a lot of really cool looking, really creative stuff to make that car. Let's talk about the steps that you take to go from a Carroll Shelby GT500 to an Eleanor. Again, starting in the front bumper, it's protruded out a little bit more with four small fog lights entered into the bumper and the upper headlight surrounds. And then you've taken those fog lights from the top and you moved them down. Got the hood. The bulge is still in the same place, it's just pronounced a little bit more and slanted a little bit more upways in the hood. As we slide back down the door again, we're into that quarter panel vent. That vent's been filled in from a GT500 style vent. And then as we move up into the upper quarter panel, again, it's the same style vent, but it's just filled in. And then when we look at the back, it's pretty identical. And then when we look at the side skirts, we have the new side skirts. And again, all my thoughts and statements on these two cars, guys, it's just my thoughts and my opinions is my perspective on it. But that's when I say something like, I believe the Eleanor design is more Carroll Shelby design than an Eleanor design. It's because that if you take out all of the Carroll Shelby mods that are the, the underlying, the, the foundation for what ended up being a lot of Eleanor mods, you're left with, in my opinion, just one piece, a custom side skirt. So I can very much see why Carroll Shelby would be really, really pissed when somebody makes small modifications to his modifications 
and then starts claiming that design is theirs and copyrights it. I can't go to Lamborghini and start filling in gaps, one here and one there, put some body fill over something and copyright it and say that's my design forever. And Lamborghini, you can't build this design. And since Classic Recreations is mentioned in the lawsuit too for copyright infringement, let's jump into that too. This car right here, absolute stunner of a car. So this Classic Recreations car, I bet a lot of you guys will look at this at first glance and say, wait, that's an Eleanor. But no, let me point out some stuff. The upper rear quarter panel scoop, that's Shelby. The lower quarter panel scoop, that's Shelby. The back, that's all Shelby. Moving forward, the hood, Shelby. Headlight position, the secondary headlight position, Shelby. Now the bumper, the bumper is what I would consider a modernization of something Shelby started doing in the GT350, I believe it was a 65. Where the bumper starts to really like protrude out and it has that nice gap, I feel like they just stuck a little bit of a front valance, a little bit of a, a, a dive down at the end of that, which is a pretty modern practice to do these days. And that's where we land with the classic recreations front bumper there. And then the side skirt, I gotta say that's just, that's just a rip off. But that's, that car is like 95% Shelby's ideas, Shelby's creations right there. And I think it's really telling that if you show a picture of this to a lot of car people, they're gonna say, oh, hey, that's an Eleanor, I know that car. And it's actually a GT500. And so I think that is really telling of how much of Carroll Shelby's work went into making that car. I believe, in my opinion, it's more Carroll Shelby car than that movie car. But let's give a little bit of credit where credit is due. Denise got this movie in the works. She got it into production and either her team or the production team called a designer one day. I don't have his name off the top of my head, but here it is on the screen. Asked him to design a car. It says he's an illustrator. I think he's the guy that illustrated the car. He drew it out. They asked Chip Foose to build it. Guessing Chip Foose built maybe all the cars for the movie or one of the cars for the movie. They built a stunner of a car. They built a really, really good looking car. And that car in that spec, although in my opinion, it is just a lot of filled in Shelby things. That's Denise's creation. Now that I know that she doesn't want me to have one of those, I don't want to have one either. A lot of it comes down to who I want to support. Carol Shelby is a goddamn American hero. His story is so epic. If you haven't done any research on it, at least pull up his Wikipedia page and read through it. He's an Air Force veteran, a chicken farmer, a small business owner, turned race car driver, one of the only Americans ever to win the 24 hours of Le Mans. And then obviously he became an epic race car builder that we all know him for today. And his impact on car culture, especially American car culture, cannot even be measured. His life is an amazing story. And like I said, an American hero, and I'm a huge fan of him. And then on the other hand, you have Denise Halicki. So who do I want to support more? Definitely Carol Shelby. So I think I've painted the picture pretty clear. I don't want an Eleanor. I'm not gonna build an Eleanor. Now, we did build a stunner of a 67 Mustang Fastback for SEMA this last year, but it is not the daily drivable car where you hop in and it has all the modern interior of a brand new Mustang that I dreamt up in the beginning. Oscar's car is, but that's not my car. I still want that daily drivable with all the modern amenities, 67 Mustang Fastback. So have I went out and bought a 2019 Mustang GT? Yeah, yeah, I did. And did I go buy all another 67 Mustang Fastback body? I did, I did. And I don't know if it's gonna be next month or next year, but sometime I am gonna finally finish this build where I body swap off of the S550 Mustang chassis, pull the whole body off and put a 67 Mustang Fastback body on. But when it comes down to the styling of this car, it'll be done with licensed Shelby parts and we'll mix in some of our own BS for Build design flair as well. And it'll be a tribute car to Carol Shelby, a real badass dude and have nothing to do with Eleanor. All right, that's my plan. That's my story. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please remember to subscribe so you don't miss when we kick that build off or anything else that may spark your interest. And we'll see you guys on the next one.